Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the public lecture organized by the Antiquities and Monuments Office. Today's topic is a 1,300 year luminescence based chronology for terrorist cultivation in Hong Kong's mountains, implications for research, knowledge exchange, and landscape management. Please note that this lecture and the Q&A session will be conducted in English. We are most grateful to have Dr. Mick Arthur, Research Associate from McCourt Center for Landscape of Newcastle University in the United Kingdom as our speaker for today. Recently, Mick and his team had conducted an interdisciplinary research project used GIS-based remote sensing data to identify, map, and characterize previously undocumented ancient features in Hong Kong's uplands. Today, Mick is going to explore the implications of their findings in relation to established historical narratives and existing archaeological knowledge. He will also consider how to research might he will consider how the research might be used to promote knowledge exchange activities and contribute to the future management of Hong Kong's upland landscape heritage. Now, let's give a warm welcome to our speaker, Dr. Mick Arthur. Thank you very much, Leighton. Um, so, yeah, as Leighton says, the uh, project that this uh, these results come from is uh, one that was uh, uh, resides in the Newcastle University McCord Centre for Landscape in the UK. And I've been working closely with uh, my two colleagues, Sam Turner, who's my kind of line manager and boss, who's a kind of internationally renowned, renowned landscape archaeologist, and also Dr. Tim Kinnaird, who's the luminescence expert on the project. So he's doing the scientific dating <clears throat> for the project. So the project has a rather long acronym, CADACOR. This is due to it being funded by the European Commission. And the European Commission always insists that every project has an acronym. This stands for Characterizing and Dating Hong Kong's Upland Historic Landscapes. Um, I'll begin by going into the project background and then say something about the computer-based remote sensing uh, work that we did, reviewing uh, old maps, aerial photographs, uh, lasers, airborne laser scanning data, LIDAR data, uh, to identify and map these upland historic features. Uh, and I'll go into some detail about the Hong Kong fieldwork that which we conducted in collaboration with our colleagues at the Antiquities and Monuments Office in 2023, more or less at this time of the year, last year. Um, and then look at the results of that scientific dating work that we've done on the upland terraces and present some conclusions and consider some next, next steps for the work. So here's a fairly classic picture of Hong Kong looking from the peak across the harbor towards uh, Chim Sao Choi. Um, and this is the image many people have of Hong Kong of this intensively redeveloped and developed coastal urban metropolis. Much of the development of the city has been around the coastline and in the lowland areas. And because Hong Kong uses a very similar development control archeological impact assessment procedure as the UK. Most of the archeological work tends to occur where there is going to be a direct impact on archeology span in the ground. And that tends to be in the urban areas, not in the mountains. So the, the, the focus of the heritage management work that has happened in Hong Kong has tended to be lowland and coastal. Of the 208 sites of archeological interest in Hong Kong, there are therefore only three in the uplands. One is a, uh, a rock carving, a game board carving, and the other two are boulder trackways. Now, what many people outside of Hong Kong who've not visited Hong Kong don't realize is that 75% of the area of the Hong Kong territory is actually still rural and relatively undeveloped. The area we know uh, very well as the New Territories or NT for short but also 40% of the area of Hong Kong's territory is mountainous uplands. And these are the country parks that many of us love to go hiking in. And these were established in the 1970s. So this is a, a fairly old 
um, satellite image of Hong Kong. You can see the airport is not even finished at this point. So this is probably 1995. Uh, but this is useful to show these red dots, which you can see all the way around the coast of Lantau Island, for example, around Lama Island, and all the way around, around the coast of the Western NT, around Deep Bay, and in various parts of the lowlands. These are the 208 sites of archaeological interest. And what you can see from this is that there is a distinct lack of archaeological sites or archaeological knowledge in these areas. This is the central uplands of the New Territories between Taimo Shan and Grassy Hill, roughly speaking, but also including uh, uh, Taito Yan, for example, following the side of the Lamchian Valley, and also the central mountains of uh, Lantau, also archaeologically quite blank, but not actually blank in terms of the archaeological remains that are there. Now, just a kind of brief recap, these are the absolutely beautiful black and white photographs taken in 1946 and 47 by a lady called Hedda Morrison. She was German, married to an American GI, a serviceman who came to Hong Kong. She traveled with him and she used a large format camera and was a very uh, accomplished photographer. And she documented the landscape of the new territories at this point in time. So it gives us a very clear indication of the, the kind of style of the historic rice farming villages with their wartong, rice drying ground and their paddy fields, and then the lower slopes terraced. The villages would terrace the, the hills, hillsides as far as they could go up the streams so the streams could irrigate the terraces and expand the amount of land they had available to grow rice. By the 19th century, the population of Hong Kong had reached a point where they had to extensify onto new land in order to feed the growing population. The, the rice land in the valley in, in the plains and valleys was already being fully utilized by that time. So this is a very typical scene at harvest. We can see here the wartong, the drying ground where the rice is laid out and a really nice view across the paddy fields of the new territories. This way of life continued more or less unchanged after World War II, right up until the 1960s. But by 1970, due to cheap imports of rice, changing social socioeconomic situation, all girls going to school, finding jobs. There was a gradual reduction in the workforce in the rural areas, and eventually rice farming was abandoned by the 1970s. Those field systems, even though they're abandoned, they're still there today, overgrown, covered in grass and scrub, but they still survive. In many areas, they still survive. Now, these villages and field systems are not recognized as cultural heritage under the Antiquities and Monuments Ordinance. Landscape as a whole is, is a category that, that is not covered by that ordinance, which is focused on sites, buildings, and monuments. A technique I'll discuss today is called historic landscape characterization. And this is a way to um, inspect historic features in the landscape, identify what period they're from, and then draw polygons or shapes around them in a geographical information system and record different blocks of landscape that relate to different cultural activities and even from different periods of development. So I, that technique was used to uh, map these features in the uplands, these upland terraces, but also the lowland rice farming landscape in the surrounding lowlands as well. And these historic landscape features were first mapped in 1905. So this is when the British conducted their survey of the new territories between 1899 and 1904, and they produced a series of detailed maps of every field, every building, every rice drying ground. So this is an incredible document for people like me interested in historic landscape. The HLC, the Historic Landscape Characterization, facilitates uh, more holistic planning and management of future landscape change. Once we know exactly what is there surviving in the historic landscape and what period it's from and, and its relative importance, that then allows our heritage managers in Hong Kong to be making better informed decisions about which parts of the landscape can be allowed to change, which elements should probably be preserved because, because they have important historic values. So this is some of the uh, data sources, the remote sensing data sources and maps that I used for my characterization work. Here on the top left 
is the 90, a sample of a 1905 map. This is from Ha Wo Hang up near Sha Tau Kok in the northern, northern New Territories, Northeast New Territories. And this records the landscape as it looked in 1905, uh, including the blocks of the historic village, uh, terraced fields going up the hillside, and then the paddy fields in the valley floor. This is 1905. If we jump forward 60 years, more or less, this is the 1963 aerial photographs taken to make the first large scale maps of the new territories. And this, you can see, is a landscape that is largely unchanged in that 60 year period. Those terraced fields are still there. The paddy fields are in the valley floor. The village is here. One thing that is not shown in this map is they didn't record the Feng Soi woodlands. This is a Feng Soi woodland here, Ha Wo Hang. In fact, the Wo Hang Valley has got some of the best preserved Feng Soi landscapes in the whole of Hong Kong. Um, and we know this is uh, an ancient woodland because many of the trees in Hong Kong in World War II, including some Feng Soi woodlands, were cut down for fuel because the regular supply of wood building wood and fuel, which came from China normally, was cut off by the Japanese occupation. So the people in Hong Kong, the Japanese military, stripped all the wood off the hillsides in that five-year period, four-year period. Um, and that use of the hillsides for fuel continued after World War II. And so the hillsides didn't really recover until later in the 20th century. But when you see a piece of woodland like this that did survive World War II, and you can see it's mature canopy woodland. This is almost certainly a Feng Soi woodland. So this is my way of identifying Feng Soi woodlands using these 1963 aerial photographs, because if surviving historic ancient woodland is there in 1963, that means it survived World War II, and this was something that was precious and preserved even during the occupation. So the Japanese soldiers would probably be very wary about damaging the village's Feng Soi woodlands because they themselves had some similar beliefs about the spirituality of trees and nature. So that, that shows us a 60 year gap there. If we jump forward another 60 years to the modern landscape, we can see it's changed a great deal. We now have all the, the hill slopes are under woodland. The Feng Sai woodland has blended into the hillside with this secondary woodland. But what you would find if you carried out a botanical survey of this woodland on the hill slope, it would be species, uh, it would be relatively less rich in terms of the species rather than the ancient woodland, which will have more, a greater variety of species in there because it's an ancient woodland. This will be a less diverse woodland on the hill slopes behind. Now, even though this is overgrown, the field systems actually still survive quite well preserved under this grassland and even under the woodland, which we can see here, when we look at the laser scanning data, this is from airborne laser scanning, which fires millions of laser beams at the ground from an aircraft and it can penetrate the woodland and reveal the landscape underneath. And this shows us that those terraces on the hill slope here are still perfectly preserved beneath the woodland that is there today. One thing to say as well is that this is the modern one to 1000 large scale map. And these are covering the whole of Hong Kong. These still show all the field systems, even though they're not used for cultivation mostly today, because they are owned by somebody. So for cadastral reasons, for land ownership reasons, these fields are still recorded surrounding the villages. So I just want to say a little bit something about the, the project rationale in particular for the uplands. When we look at the general region of Hong Kong and South China, and even further afield into Southeast Asia, there has actually not been a great deal of research by archeologists on upland landscapes. These cultivated landscapes are barely studied, in fact. This work has occurred at Ifugao in Luzon in the Philippines, these very famous World Heritage rice terraces. There's also work being done in Jiujiago in China and in one or two other locations, but very little when you consider how widespread these historic landscapes are and how important economically they were to the traditional life way of people throughout this region. In terms of the upland areas, I'm talking about uh, a notional elevation of 250 meters above sea level. That's what I consider uplands in terms of Hong Kong. And most of those areas in Hong Kong today are country parks. And for many people in Hong Kong, those country parks are viewed as places of nature. Hong Kong's green lung, where we go hiking to escape the urbanism 
the intense urbanism of the city, the concrete jungle, and we head out into the, the green lung of the hills. In truth, in truth, these upland landscapes are actually cultural landscapes. And we've now realized that there are thousands of cultivation terraces in these country park areas. In fact, I did a sample of one hectare, which is 100 meters by 100 meters square on Taimoshan. And the number of terraces I counted there, if you multiply it by the 3000 hectares of terraces that I found, we're talking several hundred thousands of these terraces. They are ubiquitous. They are widely evidenced in the remote sensing data. Now the terraces until this recent project have remained very poorly understood and therefore were potentially at risk, possibly by development, although that would tend to be small scale in the country parks, but also by climate change impacts as well. Our climate is changing. We're getting more dramatic storms, heavier rain that could have an impact on these historic landscapes. So these have remained until recently unmapped, uninventoried, in other words, not listed by the heritage authority and therefore not really protected as cultural heritage. So this was one of the major motivations for doing this work was to get these historic resources on the map. These pictures here show uh, the field work occurring in Hong Kong. So to the left here, we have my two colleagues, Sam and Tim, hiking down the hillside to inspect terraces at Grassy Hill. Um, here we're on the, um, the rescue trail under the Nong Ping cable car, which is a very ex exciting footpath if any of you have walked that. It's really up and down. You've got to be quite fit. Uh, and this is a view over the airport as we're walking towards Nelak San. And then this is my colleagues on Taimo San, including my wife, Kenneth, is just there, uh, working. She came over and helped us with the project. So this is working with our colleagues at the AMO on the slopes of Taimo Shan as well. So here's one of these amazing 1963 aerial photographs. All the features you can see in this aerial photograph are terraces, apart from one or two other things, which I'll explain shortly. Most of the terraces we see in this central area of the new territories are on north or northwest or west facing slopes. There are virtually none on south or southwest or southeast facing slopes, facing the strongest sun. This is already very interesting to observe. Mm -hmm. And these are on the high slopes. This is at 650 meters above sea level. Now, one of the problems we face with these aerial images, this looks like a flat landscape, but it's actually a 30 degree slope. And it's sloping from the bottom of the image to the top, it's sloping down from the top of Taimo Shan towards the Lamchen Valley. This feature we can see here is a stream gully running down the slope. And you can see there are terraces all over this landscape. And these are quite special terraces. Normally when we think about terraces in terms of rice growing, they would be horizontal to retain the soil and to retain the water for irrigation. These terraces go up and down across the contours. So their design is quite special and for particular reasons. In contrast to these oblique terraces between Taimo Shan and on Taito Yan and from Taimo Shan all the way to Grassy Hill, which are these oblique ones, the terraces on Lantau Island are almost entirely horizontal contour terraces, presumably designed to be able to hold water and be irrigable, be, water, be able to be watered. In terms of the broad historical context for these upland landscapes, we have the 1688 uh, Qing San'on County Gazetteer or Xin'an County Gazetteer, which refers to tea growing on Taimo Shan and in several other locations of the new territories. And it refers in particular to a special kind of tea called Wan Mo Cha, cloud mist tea, which was this special kind of green tea which loved to grow in the mountain conditions, which is also interesting in terms of the north facing slope of many of these terraces and the fact they're high in the mountains, because anybody who lives in Hong Kong knows that those locations for large parts of the year will be cooler, there'll be misty conditions, and it's quite ideal for growing tea, possibly other things as well, but certainly tea. As well as those references in the historical gazetteers to tea growing, 
we have these other sources from the Yuan Ming period talking about an indigenous population on Lantau Island referred to as Yao or Yu people who were involved in the salt working there under control of the imperial salt monopoly. So there is potentially another group of people potentially active on Lantau Island who could be associated with these different contour steppe terraces on the high mountains there. This is speculation, but it's interesting to note these different references. But all of this, of course, is masked by, by vegetation today. So that's the same landscape today. So many of those terraces are no longer visible from the air, but you can still see a few in this location are visible, but they are visible on the ground. Because if you walk down these hillsides, you're, you're stepping down one meter high terrace walls. They're actually quite large. But if we use the LIDAR data, which can see through the trees and vegetation, we can still see the terraces are well-preserved and still surviving as they were in those 1963 aerial photographs. So in terms of the project fieldwork methodology we used for this work in the mountains, uh, we, had, we attempted to address this gap in uh, the archeological knowledge of Hong Kong's uplands by identifying these cultivation terraces, these OSTs, these oblique step terraces, and these contour step terraces by using a geographical information system in which I could build these map layers and aerial photographs and LIDAR data and then make them transparent and view one through the other. So I could see every terrace that was visible in this, uh, in this remote, remote sensing data. That allowed me to map around 3000 hectares of these mountain terraces. And then once we'd identified those terraces, using that remote sensing data, I then selected 10 sites, which I thought looked interesting and accessible by hiking trails because some of these terraces are far from hiking trails and it would be very difficult to access them without getting into hiking, serious, serious hiking gear. And if you're carrying archeological equipment, you don't really want to be fighting your way down a, a densely scrub covered hillside. The other thing to bear in mind is these are protected areas. These are country parks and the vegetation should be disturbed to the absolute minimum possible. So choosing terraces near hiking trails that were relatively easy accessible was one of the criteria we used to select these 10 sites, which we then hiked into the mountains and inspected the sites to check on the condition of the terraces and to identify examples that were suitable for our geoarchaeological sampling. And a suitable terrace is one that is partially collapsed. So there's already been some damage done to the terrace it just, just by natural erosion and weathering. So we don't want to take about a perfectly preserved terrace. That would not be a good thing to do. And the dating of the terrace sediments was achieved by using something, and this is a very long name, by something called optically stimulated luminescence profiling and dating. This is a scientific dating technique which relies upon the natural radiation in the environment becoming trapped in the crystals of quartz. And this accumulates at a steady rate. So the larger the radiation dose trapped in the quartz crystals of the sediment in the terraces, the longer time it's been buried. And that's used as a dating methodology. For simplicity in future, I will call it OSLPD. Okay. So here are those 3,300 hectares of mountain terraces that were mapped uh, by the project, around 2,500 hectares in the Central New Territories. This is Taito Yan and then Taimo Shan to Grassy Hill. There's also some east of the Sha Tin Hoi and one or two small patches even on Mount Parker on Hong Kong Island. And then another large scatter of terraces on the highest mountains of Lantau. So around 2,500 hectares of oblique terraces in the central NT and around 800 hectares of the contour terraces on Lantau Island. And the three areas that we sampled were Tai Mo Shan, which is this blue uh, dot here, A, two areas of Grassy Hill at B, and then one location on Nailak San on Lantau Island. So with the collaboration of our colleagues and with the kind support of Susanna and her team at the AMO, and also with some help from uh, the loan of equipment and some technology from our colleagues at uh, Hong Kong PolyU, 
particularly Dr. Wallace Lai, and also with the permission and agreement of the AFCD of the Hong Kong government, we went in to do the field work in November and December 2023. And the first thing we did was those ground truthing surveys where we inspected the terraces, and we then identified four sites suitable for testing, as I've just mentioned, and we actually sampled 16 terraces for OSLPD dating, from which we gathered 185 samples and 17 dating samples, which were taken back to the laboratory in Scotland, in the UK, uh, and for dating purposes, as well as two soil micromorphology samples as well. So this is uh, the team inspecting uh, terraces on uh, the Maclehose Trail in the middle photograph. And if anybody's hiked the Maclehose Trail, you have probably seen these terraces as you're walking just east of Tai Mo Shan. The trail goes right through the middle of terraces in that location. We also identified in the remote sensing a strange linear feature on Nailak San, which turned out to be a quite well-built dry stone wall running straight up the hillside, not directly associated with terraces, but clearly quite an ancient feature and far remote from any settlement in, in the recent uh, historical era. So quite an interesting um, item to find. And then here we are looking, this is my colleague Sam Turner, pointing out quite uh, handily this terrace here on Grassy Hill. So this is the work we did, hiking in to identify suitable locations. And the first of those locations was Grassy Hill in the Central New Territories, just east of Leadmine Pass. And here we can see these very regularly spaced uh, oblique terraces. You can see they're very regularly laid out. And many of them have these shared linear boundaries. So we can see two blocks or two flights of terraces. They're like stairways, so we can call them flights of stairs or flights of terraces, each one ending at this linear boundary, another linear boundary running up through here. So these look to be quite well-planned, well-organized landscapes. Now, one of the issues with remote sensing images like this aerial photograph is that they compress potentially many hundreds of years of development. It looks like it's all one thing, potentially from one period but we know for a fact now that this is not true. And we can see that there are various places where these terraces are overlapping with one another. So there are more than one, there's more than one phase of development. So somebody laid out some terraces on one orientation, somebody came along later and did some on a different orientation. And we can see those overlaps in the aerial photograph. So we excavated four small sample slots at Grassy Hill 2, three at Grassy Hill 1. And this is what those terraces look like at Grassy Hill. And this is a classic example of a partially collapsed terrace. Another one here, another one here. So these are good locations to sample because the terrace is already partially collapsed. So we can do our work there with the minimum damage to the monument. When we inspected one of these linear boundaries I just mentioned, what we realized they were was quite remarkable. They're these beautifully made stone slab staircases. And these are running up the hillside. And these are clearly the first element of the terraced slope to be built. So they build the staircase up the hillside first. And then we can see that the terraces have been built onto the edge of the stairway. So there's a terrace on the left here, another terrace on the left here, a terrace on the right here, and another terrace on the right in the background. So they build the staircase, which gives them access up the hillside. And then they use the staircase while they're building the terraces. Once the terraces are build, built, the stairways then allow them access for maintenance, for planting, for weeding, for harvesting, whatever it is they're growing there. So these are very, very carefully built, uh, an, important, uh, an important new element to the kind of structural um, heritage of these upland areas. These are the small sampling slots which we excavate, which we make basically wide enough for the shoulders of a human being to be able to get in to do the sampling of the, 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 uh, the excavated section. So this is Grass Hill 1.1, 2.4 and 1.3. Uh, so that's what the excavations look like at uh, Grassy Hill. I should just go back, previous. And we then do the sampling in this back face and we also sample underneath the wall as well. So you'll see some examples of that a little bit later. This is the uh, area we sampled at 
Tai Shan. Again, you will see that the terraces look very similar to the ones at Grassy Hill, very similar regular spacing, shared linear boundaries running through the middle of lots of these terraces. Again, some overlapping terraces suggesting more than one phase of development. So these are multi-period landscapes. This is not all from the same period. Uh, and again, evidence for planning. So it seems like you could say there is some form of design template being used over a wide area of the central new territories to construct these terraces. And these are some of the terraces on Taimo Shan, which you can see are quite substantial. Some of them are really quite huge, more than a meter tall and still perfectly preserved in some cases. So these ones we wouldn't touch. Obviously, they're very intact, stable monuments. We look for ones like this one where there's been a significant collapse and we would sample in those areas to do the minimum damage to the archaeological resource. And this is what those sampling slots look like. And here we can see a column of profiling samples for the OSLPD dating. That's what we did. And that would be conducted under a black sheet. I'll talk about that shortly. And finally, we come to Nelaksan. These are a completely different design of terrace. As you can see, they're not as regularly spaced. They can be quite closely spaced or they can be quite wide apart. And they're much more, you could say, organic in appearance. These are not the same thing as the central new territories, terraces. And they're also horizontal, not sloping up and down. These are irregularly spaced. There are no shared linear boundaries joining the terraces together. But there was that wall feature I mentioned before, but that was remote from the terraces. It wasn't right next to them. And there's no obvious interaction between terraces. They seem to be separately laid out. They don't overlap with one another. So this is quite interesting, quite a contrast. And the terraces are much slighter, smaller features. They're only two or three courses high, uh, as you can see here. Very slight features, but they are horizontal. Horizontal. So see, these are some of the terraces we looked at at Nelaksan. And there they are sampled. And in all three cases here, you can see this black circular object. This is the dating sample, which we use a hammer to drive a tube, a piece of tubing, steel tubing, into the section. And that creates a completely sealed uh, sample, which we then wrap with black tape to stop any light getting in there and losing the luminescence signal. So a quick bit of science. I'll try and keep it as simple as possible just to explain a little bit about optically stimulated luminescence profiling and dating. So this is a prepared section with the samples already taken. That sampling occurs under a blackout sheet. So somebody has to crawl under the sheet using a red light torch, which you can see my colleague Tim in the top, top right. This is Tim with a red light torch. The red light preserves the luminescence signal. If we used white light, it would bleach the signal and we would lose the dating evidence. So this is collected under red light. He cleans down the surface, takes a column of regularly spaced small samples in a, a plastic Petri dish. And they then, they then go inside a black bin sack to keep the light, keep them safe from light. That's the sampling process. The basis for this technique is that the environment, wherever you go on the planet, the environment emits low level radiation at a constant rate. There's also a, a small component of solar cosmic radiation as well, but we can consider that in, in terms of this technique also as a constant. Quartz crystals, which are in all the rocks we find in Hong Kong, trap the radiation within the crystal lattice. I don't understand the science that well myself, but just accept this fact. The radiation is trapped in the crystal lattice. Lat lattice. Exposure to light of that trapped radiation will release the radiation, and the amount of light released, the luminescence, is equivalent to the age of the sample. That's the basis for the technique. So when the terraces were constructed, the hillside was cut. That would expose the sediment to light and bleach all those quartz crystals 
releasing all the radiation. When the terrace wall was then built, the radiation would then start accumulating in the crystals behind the wall. So that gives us a point. If we get a date from beneath the wall or just behind the wall, that should date the construction of the terrace. So that bleaching at construction resets the radioactive clock to zero is the terminology we use. The longer the soil has been buried behind the terrace wall, the larger the radiation dose, and therefore the bigger signal we will, we will get with the luminescence. So we excavate the sampling slot, cover with the black sheet, take the regular column of samples, and then we analyze that through this field instrument, which was designed by Tim and his team at his laboratory in Scotland, which allows us to get uh, an, an OSL reading for each of those samples down the column, and that creates a profile. That gives us a profile of intensity signals for the radiation. So this is just showing some examples of different kinds of terraces and the kinds of results that we would get with the profiling using that instrument in the field. So intensity signal is across the bottom. So the higher the signal, the older the sediment. So as we go towards the top, towards the surface, the sediment is very young. It was recently exposed to light. So the signal is very low. Where the sediment has been buried for a long time, the signal will be higher. So that's the basic idea of this technique. I won't go into too much more uh, uh, detail in this. This refers to risers. I would call them terrace walls. It just, just means the same thing. Um, the terraces we found in Hong Kong, on the mountains of Hong Kong, I would suggest are probably constructed using a combination of fill and deposition. So when, when the natural slope is cut, they would throw some of the cut material into the next terrace, but then so sediment would build up during the cultivation process as well. That's what we seem to have from the profiles that we gathered from this site. So this is uh, an example of one of those excavated uh, sample slots. So this is the rear face of Grassy Hill 1.3, which is this here. And then we also have drawn the side profile as well, which is this section coming forward through the side with the terrace wall on the front. And based on the field profile we obtained from the uh, putting those samples through the instrument in the field, we identified the best location for positioning the dating sample, which is level with uh, sample number six here. So we, we take a series of samples in the field, we put them through the field instrument, that gives us a field profile. We then retest those same samples under laboratory conditions and try to see if we can reproduce that signal. If we can, that means that the quartz uh, sample is a very good one and it will reproduce a reliable uh, age for that, for that uh, terrace. If there is a big difference, we would have to discard that sample uh, as being unreliable because there's some erratic behavior with some of the, the quartz in some of these sites. And then further processing allows us then to, to come up with uh, a result in terms of calendar age within an error margin. There is always an error margin, uh, depending on how large the errors are between the field and uh, laboratory testing and a range of other scientific variables, which I won't go into in too much detail today. So this is the table of results from the 16 terraces that we sampled in the recent field work. And you will see there are, there are a number of asterisks, these small stars here, for the testing at Taimoshan site two. For some reason, the quartz at Taimoshan is a bit strange and it didn't produce very reliable results. So we only got one very good statistically re reliable result from Taimoshan and another one, this one here, which is only based on four out of 24 samples that we put through the machine in the laboratory, only four out of 24 gave a good result, which is too low a number to be very confident in the result. But it's interesting that the result where we had 15 out of 24 good samples from Tai Mo Shan gave us a date here of AD 1310. So that's in the Yuan dynasty, late Song to Yuan. And the other one, based on a smaller sample, gave us a date in the early Ming dynasty. 
So that's what we get from uh, Taimo Shan. Grassy Hill, we can see quite a wide range of dates. So even though those terraces in the aerial photographs all look very similar and look like they might all be from the same uh, piece of terrace building uh, undertaken by the ancient people, there is actually a 500 year, a 550 year range in the age of those terraces at Grassy Hill. The earliest one is around 1100 AD, so Northern Song. And the latest one that we dated is around AD 1650, right at the beginning of the Qing Dynasty. So around a 650 year period of development of that terraced hillside on Grassy Hill. At Nailak San, oops, getting carried away. At Nailak San, the three terraces that we dated there, two of them lower down the slope, produced dates in the Ming Dynasty, 1380 and 1490 with an error range. The highest terrace of the three that we dated produced a remarkable date. And the sample is very secure. We're happy with this statistical analysis of this sample. And we think this is a very secure date in the Tang Dynasty, 730 AD, which is quite remarkable um, and a big surprise. We did not expect anything quite that early. So when we look at those uh, results and summarize them by, uh, by the site, the OSLPD testing of those 16 terraces in 2023, we managed to produce 11 statistically secure luminescence dates. At Grassy Hill Site 1, three oblique terraces there were shown to have been constructed over a period of around 370 years from the Southern Song to the late Ming dynasties around AD 1250 to 1590. At Grassy Hill Site 2, which was a few hundred meters further along the slope, uh, we tested four oblique terraces there, and we found that they had been constructed over a longer period of around 550 years between the Northern Song and the early Qing Dynasty, so around 1100 to AD 1650. At Taimo Shan, we tested six terraces there, six oblique terraces, um, but the quartz behavior, as I've already mentioned, was very strange there. And my colleague, Tim Kinnaird, who is the geologist by training, uh, but also the luminescence expert, is extremely surprised by these strange results. Because even though the geology at Taimo Shan is basically, basically granite, and the geology at Grassy Hill is more um, a form of tuff, so what would have been ejected from the ground as lava, rather than cooling inside a magma chamber like Taimo Shan, there isn't a huge difference in the basic geology of those two areas, but the sediment, the quartz has behaved in a very different way. Very strange. This is why we always try to test at least three or four terraces in each location, because sometimes you can get strange results. So you have to allow for the fact that some of your samples maybe will not produce a good result, which is why we always test multiple terraces. But the time of Shan was, particularly strange that only one out of six produced a very good result and a second one produced an approximate date. And that was in the Yuan dynasty around AD 1310 and another one in the early Ming around AD 1400. Still interesting dates, nevertheless, based on our historical framework of AD 1688, and that Sanon County Gazetteer referring to tea growing, that was referring to tea growing, it may, it may appear, that was actually begun many centuries earlier, potentially. We still haven't proved that these things are, are used for growing tea, but the circumstantial evidence supports that interpretation at the moment. And then on Nailak San, in a completely separate part of Hong Kong on Lantau Island, these contour terraces, these horizontal terraces, the three terraces we tested there were found to have been constructed over an extended timescale of around 750 years, with two producing dates in the early to middle Ming dynasty, AD 1380 to 1490, while the uppermost of the three terraces, closest to the Nongping Rescue Trail, uh, was dated to the Tang dynasty and around AD 730, which was a really remarkable and surprising discovery. So how do we make sense of, of these results? Uh, it, 
in terms of our broader historical context and in terms of our understanding of the work that we've done so far in Hong Kong. What we can say is that the regularity of the oblique terrace layouts, the ones that go up and down across the uh, slopes in the central New Territories on Tai Mo Shan and Grassy Hill, and there are also very similar ones uh, on Tai To Yan, Tai To Yan, which is, I, lo I love that, that the Chinese name means sharp broadsword. It's a great name, Tai To Yan, means a broadsword because it's a long, sharp ridge. So it's, a, it's an excellent name. And this is something that fascinates me, actually, as an aside, as a landscape archaeologist, I'm very interested in toponyms, the way people name places and give them very um, specific meanings relating to how they look and maybe their cultural significance for the people who first saw them and decided that looks like a sharp broadsword. Let's call it Broadsword Ridge, Taito Yang. So that's just very interesting as an aside. Um, so we're looking at these very regular layouts with these shared linear boundaries, looks like planning, looks like the possible use of a design template, which is repeated again and again and again over quite a large area. So are we looking in this case, given that tea growing was mentioned in an imperial gazetteer, which suggests it was a fairly well-known industry at that time in the Qing dynasty, are we looking at something that was laid out as an, an imperial project under some larger control scheme? Or was it something that was just a very well-organized local business within this region? We have this historical reference to cloud mist tea, Wan Mo Cha, um, but we still don't know for sure whether that was what was being grown on all these terraces. We know for certain though that these upland terraces have no connections with the lowland rice farmers. When they were interviewed in 1899 to 1904 in that big survey of the new territories when all those lowland fields and lower hill slope terraces were mapped, nobody claimed these old terraces on the hillsides. Some people in historical times have been interviewed and been aware of them, and even some villages in parts of the new territories still pick tea today on the mountains. Some of the elderly villages who still know where to find the tea bushes. So tea is something that is in the local people's consciousness in these rural areas, but this large scale production seems to have been something that was separate from the populations of rice farmers in the lowlands. When we look at these cruder and more irregular contour terraces on Lantau Island, it suggests to me that there is possibly some different socioeconomic origin, growing uh, different crops potentially, they're looking to retain the water by making the terraces horizontal. The ones on Nailak Sam were also next to a stream. So they could be they could channel water from the stream or they could carry water from the stream and irrigate those terraces. The ones high on the mountains in the central New Territories are mostly high above the level where the springs emerge and become streams lower down the hill slope. So they're on the dry upper slopes in many cases. So maybe a different socioeconomic origin for those terraces on Lantau, maybe a different function. The Tang Dynasty date from Nailaxan is, to say the least, striking. This is the first evidence in Hong Kong for any Tang Dynasty activity away from the coast. Around the coast of Hong Kong in this period, we have extremely extensive remains of a coastal salt industry. Lots of stoves on storm beaches behind the sandy bays all the way around Hong Kong, Hong Kong's coast, in particular around Lantau Island. Every uh, storm beach behind a sandy bay, we find these salt stoves. So, th and this is historically related to the imperial salt monopoly, which supposedly was controlling a local indigenous population who were working, producing the salt under control of the imperial salt monopoly. Now, what we've never found from the Tang Dynasty, despite all this industrial activity all the way around the coast of Hong Kong, we've never found a single Tang Dynasty settlement. In all the work that's been done by archaeologists over many decades, we've never found a settlement. And we've only found one cemetery at San Tao, which is actually down on the coast below, below Nailak San. Um, the Ming Dynasty terraces at Nailak San are also far remote from any contemporary rice farming settlement. 
So even though we, we think we had Ming settlement on Lantau Island, this is far away. These, these mountain terraces are far away from those settlements. So who made these terraces? That's a very good question. The sloping and horizontal upper surfaces of the oblique and contour terraces suggest different uses. The contour terraces are suitable for irrigation. The sloping terraces are suitable to create free draining soil and move the water away from the terraces to keep them free draining. So they're quite different. So it suggests that they're cultivating different crops, uh, suggests different uh, contrasting management regimes in these two locations, possibly also different cultural connections, potentially an indigenous population on Lantau Island, perhaps relating in the Tang Dynasty to those coastal populations working in the salt industry, uh, and maybe a diff and certainly different groups in the Central New Territories being involved in this large scale enterprise to make these thousands of terraces between Taito Yan, Taimo Shan, and Grassy Hill. This must have involved hundreds, if not thousands of people. Thousands, it would seem, given the, the extent of the terraces. So in terms of what next uh, for this research, presently, I'm working through the many questions that the research has raised in terms of interpreting these findings. Uh, while writing reports and papers for publication. Uh, I'm also in the process of applying for grants and funding to do more research in Hong Kong, to extend this research to the sampling of other terraces, and to also to better understand upland land, land use across a wider area. If we manage to get funding to do future work, it would definitely need to include some additional scientific analysis things such as soil micro CT, which is a way of analyzing, taking a column of sediment through the terrace and preserving it in situ. So you're taking a column sample in a tin and then seal it with tape, take that away and then analyze it under a high power microscope. And if we do that, we can potentially see layers of sediment accumulation and then stabilization where the surface was being cultivated and then more accumulation, and then maybe an older uh, stabilization layer. So that allows us to try and understand how the terraces were being cultivated. And even, for example, if soil fertility was being managed, are they adding organic matter? Because that would show up in that micro CT analysis. Were they manuring? Were they adding other organic material? We could also do some research looking for plant micro fossils, tiny uh, parts from plants which survive these are silica, silica bodies called phytoliths, and these survive in the soil for thousands of years. And they've been found in Hong Kong previously uh, when they were excavated at Sha Ha uh, near Saigon. Um, so we could potentially look to recover some plant macrofossils. And plant uh, phytoliths are specific to a species of plant. Each plant has a different shaped microscopic phytolith. So that is diagnostic for a particular plant. So we can say whether they were growing taro, whether they were growing tea or rice, if there are any surviving in the soil. That might then allow us to identify the crops that were being grown on these mountain terraces. I just wanna finish off with a few photos of the many people who helped us with uh, the project. This is the uh, AMO's wonderful old yellow van, which managed to get us to the top of Taimo Shan. It was slightly nerve wracking, full of people going up Taimo Shan, uh, but being a government vehicle, it's well maintained. So that was a, uh, that was a relief. And these are uh, members of the AMO team, the AMO surveyors, uh, junior curators who came and helped us on site. My colleague Sam and I, this is my wife, and this is our uh, very jolly driver. And then this is one of the teams on the day, one of the days we're working on Taimo Shan, there's Leighton who introduced me today. Uh, and then we also had a visit from uh, Ivan Ho Chang uh, and Susanna and a few other colleagues from the AMO came to visit our first uh, work at Grassy Hill. And that's just a record of, of, of those events. These photographs were take, taken by uh, Andy Yu and Lai Kwok Wai who are working for the AMO. And that's, uh, that's everything I'd like to say, I think, for now. Thank you very much for listening. If there are any questions, I'd be ha happy to hear. 
So first of all, thank you very much for the wonderful sharing by Dr. McArthur. We now have entered the Q&A session. Please raise your hand and our colleagues will pass the microphone to you. Meanwhile, Zoom audience are welcome to submit your questions via the Q&A panel. So actually, I do have a question from the uh, Zoom audience. Mm. So uh, this Mr. Lam was asking like, uh, so it's a about the tank sample at Nailat Shan. Mm. So he said, it seems that the samples below it are younger. So mm. is he understanding this correctly? Yeah, further down the slope. Right. Yeah, so the there were three terraces. The uppermost terrace was Nailat Shan 1.1, which is the one that dated to the tank. Who, 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 who's asked the question? Is this on the, yeah. on Zoom? On Zoom, on Zoom. okay. Um, yeah, so the, the uppermost terrace, highest, uh, elevation turned out to be the one that had the earliest date. That was the Tang Dynasty. The two lower down the slope were, were actually very close together, only about a meter apart, two meters apart maybe, and they were both Ming Dynasty in date. Right. So, uh, if we excavate more terraces in that area, then maybe we'll get a broader spread of dates rather than this huge gap between the Ming Dynasty to the Tang. And of course, one Tang date. As an archaeologist, I'm never satisfied with one date from a period. It could be an anomaly. We're very happy with the scientific analysis that was done on that terrace. And statistically, it's very uh, secure, but it is just one date from one terrace. So I would like to test more areas on Lanto Island to be able to have more confidence that there is other activity of this earlier date on Lanto Island. Yes, and I would also I like it be, uh, to ask another question about the time ocean sample. Do you think it would be helpful if we go back to collect another set of sample, or is it just like how the, the things behave there that cannot mm. be dated easily for us? That would be a conversation to have with Tim, right. Tim Kinnaird, who's our geologist and luminescence specialist. Given that we sampled six terraces and we only got one really good result, right. that might be a disincentive that might put right. Tim off actually putting a lot more effort in there. But there are many other terraces in that same area that we could maybe try a different slope. We could even look at the, the more detailed geological mapping right. for Tai Mo Shan, because much of the geology in Hong Kong has variations within quite small areas. There are intrusive features, there are, there are different geologies quite close together. So it could be that we could look at another area of Tai Mo Shan, which had slightly different geology, and look to test the terraces there, and we might get a, a better result. It could just be that particular slope has a certain geology which is somehow problematic in terms of the behavior of the quartz. Right. So Tai Mo Shan is a really huge mountain. Yeah. Um, and already in my mind for future research, I'm thinking about two other areas on Tai Mo Shan. In fact, there are some of these oblique terraces on the south facing slope, high on Tai Mo Shan, in an area that's also known as Sifong San, which is a, a kind of another peak between uh, Tai Mo Shan and Grassy Hill. There's another, another peak there, and there are some terraces on the south facing slope there. So that might be an area to test, which is still part of Tai Mo Shan effectively. And then there are other slopes around the edge of Tai Mo Shan. We could check the geology and maybe find an alternative location to test, but it's, uh, yeah, it's a slight concern because it's quite difficult to get there. Right. It's quite hard work. Um, and if you only get a very poor result, then it's quite difficult. But yeah, I, I would want to do further testing in that area for sure, but not on that same slope again. Right. Are there like, any questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, our colleagues are coming over in a minute, in a second. Yeah, that, excellent presentation. I have a question. What's the oldest uh, record of population civilization in Hong Kong that's been found in villages or whatever? What is the oldest? Do you know? The oldest archaeological evidence? In Hong Kong. Six and a half thousand years. I see. Dating back to what we call the Middle Neolithic. Okay, and that's coastal populations of fisher hunter foragers. I see. Okay. And we find evidence for them around all around the coast of Hong Kong. So it goes back quite high. So yeah. basically, they're going up to the mountains uh, to get unusual crops that uh, won't get flooded down below, like rice. I guess, like you're saying, uh, the tea. 
any other stuff. Like Adoree Farm has something up on the hill. They talk about that. Sure. Yeah. And the other day when I was hiking, I was telling my hiking friends, look over to the side over there in those trees. It looks like it's uh, certain the, the bushes are grown at a certain level. Kadori Farm, you can see many of these yeah, terraces because the they're yeah. growing just above Kadori Farm. Yeah. In fact, the area we excavated at uh, Taimoshan is a few hundred meters beyond the upper upper limit of time of uh, yeah, Kadori Farm. You see, yes, you see that. Actually, many years ago, the building behind this building uh, had the Archaeological Society, and mm -hmm. I went uh, was headed by a fellow friend of mine, Bill Meacham, and we went to one of the islands, and I dug up some corded pottery. Mm. That goes back a couple of thousand years or more. So, yeah. so it was very, very interesting. Thank All you. right, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, apart from the OSLPD, uh, is there also any other tools or analysis which can help estimate the uh, years, the history uh, of the uh, terrace or the samples? Is it the micro city also can help estimate uh, the sample's history? Okay, the, the, the micro CT is good for analyzing the depositional history of the terrace in terms of whether there's stabilization layers where there's been manuring and cultivation, and then maybe a, a coarser period of buildup of the sediment, and then maybe another stabilization layer where there was cultivation earlier. But it's actually quite difficult to get dating from that. You, you could get a relative, you get a relative sequence but it won't give you an absolute calendar date. Um, and one of the problems you have with terraces, generally speaking, is number one, they generally don't contain any cultural materials. So you don't find sherds of pottery, which is one of the classic ways we date archeological sites in Hong Kong, because the pottery is quite diagnostic through different periods. But these kind of terraces in the mountains, you're unlikely to find ceramic sherds. The other thing you might try to date using is charcoal, Charcoal, any organic kind of matter would allow you to date using radiocarbon. But if you use radiocarbon dating for a piece of charcoal in a terrace, it doesn't necessarily date the use of the terrace. It could have washed in there from a hill fire and just be a piece of burnt wood from a hill fire that's washed in and has no relation to the cultural activity. Whereas by dating the actual, the profile of the sediment itself, we know we're actually dating the construction of the terrace using OSLPD. This is why OSLPD is revolutionizing this kind of archaeology, because these kind of features previously could not be dated. And it's now being used in all over Europe, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, in the Middle East, now Hong Kong, um, and will soon be used in uh, several other locations as well. So this is quite, um, it's quite a revolutionary development in terms of the dating of these features, because normally we can't date them. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay, thanks. Thank you very much for this. Um, I have a question. So um, during this season of excavation, is the focus only on quartz, or is there any um, traces of archaeobotanical um, um, traces or samples that you collected? Or is this saved for um, future research? But yeah, that, that is, Basically, every piece of archaeological research has a budget, okay? And the budget, the budget for this project was to do this basic mapping to identify and map these features and to have a program of fieldwork to try and get some kind of basic dating chronology. Um, the additional work involving the paleobotanical analysis, looking for the plant remains, do the micro CT, that involves multiple other specialists, and they each have expensive lab work bills. And so that would be for a future project, we would have to get a larger sum of money to allow us to do what we did this time, but also to do these additional scientific anal analyses as well. And that's something I'm working on at the moment, trying to um, achieve a more complex project while keeping it within a reasonable budget, which is a big headache actually. <laughs> so that's something for the future. Uh, thank you very much. In fact, I, I'm I'm very mind blowing by uh, attending this seminar because I haven't really heard too much about the uh, local economy, or especially the farming landscape or the early economy of uh, especially Lan Town. Mm. And I think that's quite amazing. Uh, well, as a retired person, I'm quite interested in the local history, but I have never, even for the local historians, having said too much on this topic. I think that's a very exciting, especially your 
topic give a very eye-catching uh, title. 1,300 years. I said, really? <laughs> it's something like that. Because I've never heard of that. And just for one thing, uh, for information, um, I think there's a local historian have said something about the Lantau economy. Mm. And particularly the one that you mentioned about the, uh, the salt making, mm. which in fact caused a lot of troubles. Oh, even to the local history, right. because uh, they said that because they then tried to make the private sort making, and then eventually being banned down by the uh, um, government, mm. central government. They sent in troops, mm. and as a result, they even make some kind of revolution and fight back to Guangzhou, etc. Well, around 1197, yeah. Yes, this, exactly. is, this is a well-documented yeah. historical event. Yes. Yeah. So that's uh, quite interesting. Yeah. And the uh, second thing is that uh, just uh, very interesting to know, uh, other than quotes, in other similar uh, time indicating evidence that can be produced, I, I'm just saying. The other, can... the other mineral that is commonly used for dating is feldspar which is also very widely occurring, but it's less, I, as I understand it, I'm not an expert. If my colleague, Tim Kinnaird was with me, who's the geologist and luminescence expert, he could explain better, but feldspar is less reliable than quartz. Quartz is ubiquitous, occurs all over the planet and has quite predictable behavior. So quartz is the preferred substance. But I think there would be other minerals that you could use for different techniques. Oh, hello. Thanks for your lecture. And just now uh, you mentioned about um, there was uh, the first time finding out the kind of uh, salt industry uh, far behind the coast. For the first time you uh, in history, you found it. And so would the salt industry far away from the coast up hill there, up on the hill. And so was it a kind of legal or illegal kind of business at the time? Okay, so because no, the, the salt making I referred to was, was at the coast. That's Tang Dynasty salt making. That was only occurring at the coast. Mm. The terraces in the mountains were being used for something else. Oh, so we have we have no evidence for salt salt working on the hill. Up there. No. No salt no. in the no, no, no. It's too far away from the sea well, shore. Well, yeah, it would whatever. be a strange place to make salt unless they could quarry rock salt from the ground. Oh, if they found salt. if they found a geological deposit in the mountains of salt, then they could mine it. But on the the terraces are cultivation terraces used for growing some crops that we don't exactly know what yet, but potentially tea, potentially hill rice on Lantau Island, potentially taro, um, yam, a whole range of different things, but but not, not no, 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 no evidence for salt working. Oh, it means the salt, uh, the pet or whatever, is down there near the seashore. It's down at the uh, coast, yeah. The coast. yeah. And so you found it. Yeah, and it's very widely evidenced in Hong Kong archaeology. Uh -huh. We find these circular stoves around three meters diameter, and they had a flat top. And we think they were using like woven bamboo pans lined with uh, lime to make them waterproof. And then they put the brine in the pan and boil it to extract the salt. And this was a very widespread industry in, in, from the Sui to Tang dynasties. Are they still used nowadays? Not still used no. anymore. No, they're just buried in the ground. Buried down there. Yeah. And so it means if you excavate or whatever, yeah, you can exactly. find it out. But yeah. have you ever done this or whatever? Of course. Yeah. When I was working in uh, Lama Island. Oh. Lama Doa. Uh, Lama Doa. Yeah. <laughs> and so you found it. Oh, they got, yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh. yeah. And so. Yeah, we found some, yeah. Was it announced in, in the news? Or um, to the public? Probably at the time, but it's a quite a long time ago. Oh, 10 Twen years 20, ago. 2010, oh, 20. something like that, 2011. Oh. And they've been found many times by different archaeologists uh -huh. over the years. And so what happened to them now? Because when the archaeologists, they found it, so what did they do to this kind of we just, uh, historical site? Record it, recover any, recover any pottery, artifacts, remains, oh, the pottery, and then yeah. backfill. Mm. Put the soil back in, oh, and if back. and if the Antiquities Monuments Office knows where it is, it will then be preserved in the ground mm. and avoided by future development. Oh, okay, and it, it actually belongs to Hong Kong government. Yes, the crown land <laughs> or whatever at the time. Okay. Thanks. Can 
I've still got a few questions online. Okay. And, uh, Can I take, let's, I'll just take a drink. <laughs> okay, no problem. Take your time. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to go through it a little okay. bit. And then there's one uh, person online that's asking you to share it, uh, you know, your field search experience or maybe something uh, that should be cautious about for the My what's uh, your uh, your your field search experience. Yeah, field search. So your field experience. Field experience. Yeah, yeah. In this, uh, That's a very general project. question. Like yeah. In this project. Yeah, I think it's. I think he's sorry. specific to this project. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, the the, the field work um, when you are excavating on the top of a mountain, it helps if you've got a yellow van provided by AMO. Otherwise, the, many of the sites I've been looking at for future research are not so close to roads. So that would involve possibly an hour's hiking. For example, in Taito Yan, that would involve hiking from the Lamchun Valley to the top of the hill and then over the other side and down again or around from the valley at the back. So it's hard work digging in the mountains, especially when you're not a spring chicken anymore. I'm now 60. Um, so I don't do that much hard digging anymore. I rely on some younger people like Leighton to do more of the hard digging. Um, the experience of the field work, I mean, just generally good, very interesting, amazing cooperation between our colleagues in the AFCD. They were wonderful because it's, it's a country park area, it's protected, and therefore we had to negotiate carefully about the way we were, would excavate and the, the way we would try and mitigate any damage to the, the plants, the flora, the fauna. And so it was um, a lot of planning to, to make it work but with a lot of support from our colleagues in the AMO and the AFCD, um, it turned into a very successful project, such that I would come back and want to do it again, <laughs> so, if we can find some funding to do that. So it was a good experience. I enjoyed it very much. I think one last question we have online is like, um, this Mr. Lamb is asking, after finding out you know, these uh, terraces as heritage, are there any other, you know, uh, suggestions or plans for conservation of these uh, terraces? Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, in terms of conservation, when you look at the terraces on, for example, Taimo Shan, most of them are extremely well preserved. These were really well built and they include in some cases boulders up to a meter in diameter, really huge boulders. So these people were moving serious thousands of tons of rock around on the hillside. And these are very stable structures. Another analysis that I'm just presently working on, didn't have chance to finish it before I came to Hong Kong, is using some slope risk data, landslide data provided by the Geotechnical Engineering Office of the Civil Engineering Development Department and comparing the distribution of landslide crowns, the point where a landslide starts, in relation to the distribution of these terraces we found. And it looks, based on my initial analysis, that there are fewer landslides in areas that were terraced in antiquity than on slopes that were not altered by terracing. So the terraces actually make the slopes more stable. So there is an interesting um, implication in terms of future landscape management for these terraces, which I want to discuss tomorrow with my colleagues in the government in terms of a workshop about how these terraces actually may make hillsides more stable in a changing world and a changing climate. So with more intense rainstorms, bigger typhoons, slopes with terraces are likely to be more stable than slopes without terraces. So the ancient people have actually done us a favor by building these terraces to actually make the upper mounds and slopes safer than they might otherwise be. All right. I think okay. I'll leave it there. Yeah, sure. <laughs> So uh, are there any other questions from our audience here today? If not, I think that's it for today. Well, thank you again. Let's give a big round of applause for Dr. McArthur. And please stay tuned on our latest announcements regarding the upcoming education activities of AMO. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you, Layton, for MCing. Thank you.